Uh, I'm State Senator Jamie Eldridge. I'm very proud to represent South Row, and I know that uh, Representative Carolyn Dykema, uh, who, who I represent South Row with, I think she'll be coming by later in, in speaking. Um, I want to thank uh, Ryan Donovan, Donovan, of course, for organizing the breakfast and also for allowing me to, to speak early. I apologize, but I, I have a, another event to attend to in, in Maynard. Um, but thanks so much for coming. You know, I, I really feel like the, the legislative library breakfasts are in, in many ways a kickoff to the budget season in general for the legislature. And I think probably everyone here, you know, knows the schedule, but the, you know, the governor came out with his budget. Um, the House will, will do their budget in March and then, and then the Senate will come out in, in April. And um, I had, had already received a number of materials from the Mass Board of Library Commissioners and all the, the local librarians who are, who are here. Um, and, you know, what I'm really seeing in the district I represent, which is 14 communities, uh, called the Middlesex and Worcester District is sort of the last wave of of, um, of new libraries. So I know you know Westboro is is working that. I see Maureen here, um, so very excited about that. We've had a chance to sit down in, in Westboro to look at that plan. Um, Marlboro, which I think has been like a at least a ten year effort, perhaps many decades, um, is uh, is is finally uh, going forward in Marlboro. And then uh, Littleton, which was an equally long uh, battle, if you will. Um, uh, the town meeting approved the Littleton Library. <clears throat> but I, I also know there's a, a waiting list, and I, I had the um, chance uh, earlier today, uh, excuse me, to speak with Roland, uh, the chair of the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, about uh, the bill, uh, the $150, $150 million uh, bond to, to eliminate uh, the wait list, to get libraries who are on the wait list off the wait list. So, so I know um, that that would, that would help uh, Westboro. Um, so that's really important. So that's certainly something I support. And then on the on the budget front uh, before us, um, I understand there's a, a request for an increase of $2 million uh, to support state aid to public libraries. Uh, very strong supporter of that. As well as um, uh, the Worcester Talking Book Library, which I'm always a big supporter of, the library system in general. And um, and of course, uh, the Massachusetts Center for the Book. So those are, those are some of the line items that I've always been focused on. I know there's a few others here too. And, and hopefully you know that the Metro West, you know, sort of this region for legislators, very strong supporters for libraries. Um, I, was, I was speaking to, to Roland earlier is that, you know, in the, in the age of, of, of Facebook and Amazon, um, the, the, the truth is that, you know, more and more people are going to libraries more than ever. Uh, it doesn't matter what the state of the economy is. It doesn't matter, um, you know, what sort of new technology is out there. People continue to come to, li to, to libraries. And I think the thing that I, I often reflect upon in my hometown of Acton is, you know, putting aside people, you know, taking out uh, uh, books and, and, you know, studying and things is that it, libraries are such a place for people to come together and, and get to a consensus and agree on issues in town. Um, you know, most committees, uh, most sort of civic activities in the town, um, more often than not, those meetings are happening in our libraries. So I really appreciate, um, you know, the importance of that and the importance for the state to provide the physical infrastructure and the state support to make sure that our libraries is as welcome as possible to everyone. And, you know, to everyone is, is it a particularly important point because uh, Metro West really has seen an increased amount of diversity. Um, the district I represent, again, 14 communities, very significant uh, Chinese, Indian, Latino, Brazilian populations. <clears throat> and actually, over the past couple of years, at least in the Acton area, I've seen an increase in the African immigrant population making sure that you know our books, our videos, uh, et cetera, are available in different languages, different cultures. And so that's really important too. And I know how responsive uh, library directors are, uh, library trustees, and, and the staff in general. So thanks so much for having me. I apologize I have to leave early. Um, I leave it in great hands with Ryan and, uh, and everyone else here. But thanks so much for your due. And I will be prioritizing these items I mentioned uh, when I have my meeting with the Senate Ways and Means Chair next month, or excuse me, this month, it's March. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, we don't actually have a speaker from the Friends of the South Bro Library this morning, but I do want to acknowledge that two of the members are here. Um, Hal and Sandy Keys, thank you for coming. Um, if you just want to wave so people know. <laughs> People should know the legend. Um, 
I'd also just like to acknowledge several members of the Board of Library Trustees in Saltboro who came this morning. So Mar you're gonna hear from Marguerite Landry in just a few minutes, but if we could also, I would also like to give a big thank you to Amy Azdani for helping me provide the majority of the breakfast, which if you, we did this several years ago in 2015 and 2016. This is better than both of those breakfasts combined. <laughs> so thank you, Amy. Um, and also um, amazing help from Jane Davis and Kim Regan, who are two of our other trustees who are right in the back. You guys want it? <laughs> <laughs> so I know everyone didn't probably come here to hear from me. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Marguerite Landry and let her tell you a little bit about the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. I'm, I'm Marguerite Landry. I, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm chair of the Board of, of Trustees. I don't have a prepared speech. I just had two impressions. Uh, one is that wherever I go and I talk about the library, I'm hearing from residents spontaneously. I love the library. And I think that's probably why we're all in the business. Um, it's, a, it's a place that since the library at Alexandria 2,000 years ago, people have always thought it was important um, and a place where people could come and, and just learn and talk. And I think that's why we're all here. The budgets make it cut. The budgets make it better. We have to you know, fight over that part of it sometimes. But uh, we're really part of a very uh, special crew of people, I think. And so I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming and for your um, for your heartfelt interest in, in our organization and other libraries in the state. So thank you. Need to be better about coming up to introduce <laughs> everyone. Sorry. So this is, these are probably two of my favorite speakers who are coming up. Um, but we have uh, local sure. residents, Grace and Emma, who are gonna tell us a little bit about how they use our library. to the library my whole entire life. I like to read to the, yeah. I like to talk to the librarians, read all the books they have and go to the awesome programs. And I really love hunting for the Dewey Decimals. <laughs> Hi, my Hi, my name is Grace and I'm 13 years old, and I've been coming to the library my whole life, and mm, I love talking to Miss Amy and Miss Kim, and I love reading all the books. Thank you for having me. Thank you, girls. You can see if they answer any questions. <laughs> All right, next we have Assistant Town Administrator, Vanessa Hale. Thank you, Ryan. Um, my name is Vanessa Hale, as Ryan said. I'm the Assistant Town Administrator here in South Borough. I've been here for just shy of 20 years, so I've, I've had the pleasure of working with um, several library directors in my tenure. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Mark Purple, our Town Administrator, is also here. Um, so, you know, we're just here to bring greetings from the community. I, I think when we hired Ryan, he had no idea he was also going to become a facility director. <laughs> um, he's had to deal with a myriad of issues, um, mostly floods, um, <laughs> since, since he's come here. But, you know, he's got a you know, terrific uh, sense of humor and, uh, you know, he's just worked so hard every day. Um, I also wanted to note our uh, selectman, member of our board selectman, Sam Styrus, is also here this morning. So we're, we're delighted um, that, that he's able to join us. Um, you know, I'm also the chair of the Friends of the Library in Shrewsbury, where I live, so <laughs> nice to have our uh, trustee Nancy Gilbert here. Um, so, you know, I really think my role has, has been to sort of help tell the story of the <coughs> library uh, whenever we're talking to the selectmen, um, when we're getting ready for town meeting, and um, certainly when we're um, in conversation with Representative Dykema, who's been a tremendous support to our entire organization. So, so thank you for being here today. I 
kept running up and I forgot I had a mic right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Maureen Ambrosino, the Westboro Library Director. It's, it's about to get serious because we're going to talk about funding guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm not here as a representative today of a, one of the formal library groups, um, but I did ask Brian for a few minutes to talk about the library construction program, which um, Senator Eldridge alluded to a little bit when he spoke this morning. <clears throat> I see some of you zoning out because you think, oh, this doesn't apply to me. This isn't going on in my town. But it really does. It applies to all of us. Um, some of us more urgently than others. Um, but before I get into that piece of it, um, do you remember a few years ago, there was a really famous speech that was going around on the internet from a Navy admiral? And you'll probably remember it as the speech where he says, to be successful in life, make your bed every day. Um, I was watching inspirational speeches uh, recently, and there was a piece of that speech that really, um, caught my attention related to this whole issue. And that was his little segment about what he called the Munchkin Crew. Um, I don't know if you remember that piece of it, but he was a, a tall, um, big guy and was on a, a boat crew with other tall, big guys. And he used to make fun of the, the little guys. There was a little boat crew of guys who were no taller than 5'5". Five, five. And he talked about how the Munchkin crew would paddle out beyond the breakers of the waves, and um, that they out paddled, out swam, and outlasted the big guys, which will all make sense in just a minute. Um, but that was a really important visual. So in a few minutes, uh, Commissioner Oceanbine will share some information with you about the bond bill that uh, Senator Eldridge also mentioned, and a spending cap. Don't zone out. Don't <laughs> talk about that either. Because I want you to take notes. Uh, really pay attention to what he's going to say about that because uh, that message is really critical. And you all have homework. You didn't know you were coming and getting homework, but you have homework. Uh, after the breakfast today, uh, sometime this week when you're back at your desk or at your office, um, my request to you is that you send four emails um, to the governor the lieutenant governor, your state senator, and your state representative. <coughs> I'm lucky enough, I get to send a couple extras because I have three state reps um, <laughs> that represent Westboro. Um, but I hope you'll use the details that Commissioner Oceanbine gives you to tell your story of why all libraries are important to the Commonwealth <laughs> and to our communities. Um, one of our strengths in libraries, as you know, is how we work together, and this is a chance for us to to come together and do that. Your library may not be on the waiting list for construction funds like mine. It might not be under construction like Margaret's. Um, and you might not be one of the 40 plus communities that are interested in doing a project in the future. But know for sure that when the time comes for your library to do a project, we'll all be there to help you. So you've all now been drafted into my Munchkin crew. Mm -hmm. um, we might not have big numbers or a relatively speaking a big ask, but um, as libraries are, we're strong when we work together and we never let our boat capsize or let our crewmates be tossed overboard into the water. Um, so again, please take a few minutes to this week to email the governor, lieutenant governor, your state senator and your state rep and help all of the libraries who are waiting for funding for critical reno renovations so that we can all remain the heart and the hub of all of our communities in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Next up, we have Roland from the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. I'm worried about mispronouncing your last name. <laughs> <laughs> Roland, <don't worry> about it. <laughs> it is Ocean Bind. So. Maureen, you, you set me up beautifully. <laughs> um, so I'm here today 
to deliver the medicine. Now, I, I apologize up front. What I'm going to be talking about is maybe a little bit dry, but uh, uh, but but this is where the rubber meets the road. So it's like I have to do it. I want to just first of all thank MLA for. Um, organizing these breakfasts in the Southport Public Library for hosting this morning's breakfast. And thank you to the local legislators um, who have uh, come today. Thank you so much for your past and continued support for library funding. We had a pretty good budget year this year. Uh, we're in fiscal 2020 right now, and um, six of our seven budget lines were funded at or above the requested level. I think that's the first time that's ever happened. We are so very, very grateful. Um, and yet, even if we receive our full ask for this year, which is an increase of 2.9 million, library funding will still be, unfortunately, below what it was in 2009, at, which is over a decade ago. And in fact, it's even lower than it was in 2001, mm -hmm. almost two decades ago. So in library land, we have never really fully recovered from the effects of the recession of 2008. So today, I have three things. I want to ask of you. I want you to talk to, as Maureen said, I want you to talk to your legislators about library funding, ask your trustees, friends, groups, patrons, supporters, and to contact legislators. Thank them and impress upon them the importance of adequate library services for you and your family and your neighbors, and ask them to make library funding a priority. Number two, we're focusing this year on state aid to public libraries. That is our priority. Line number 709501. As I walk through these in a moment, you might want to refer, in fact, to this sheet right here, which shows all the lines. Um, so please emphasize the importance of state aid to public libraries for your library. And then number three, I'm going to talk for a moment about the construction program. We are urging support of House uh, of Bill H4154, which is currently in the House Committee on Ways and Means and includes $150 million in continuing funding for the Massachusetts Public Library Construction Program, and an increase in our annual bond spending from 20 to $25 million annually, and that, more about that in a moment. So we are emphasizing uh, for our 2021 legislative agenda our state aid to public libraries line, which is 7,095 for which we are in requesting an increase of almost $2.1 million. And that uh, our total increase for all of our lines is requested at 2.9. So that represents the bulk of our ask for this year. Um, we are requesting 3% increases for most of our other lines. However, somewhat larger increases for our agency's administrative line 9101 due to our impending office move, as well as a larger increase for the Massachusetts Center for the Book, line 709508, which has been level funded since FY 2016. Our total requested increase for all seven lines is $2.9 million. State aid to public libraries, a few details about that. It is an annual voluntary program administered by the MBLC that distributes local aid to municipalities. About 98% of all public libraries in the state uh, participate. It encourages municipal support and improvement of public library services. It bolsters reciprocal resource sharing among libraries compensates for differences in municipal funding capabilities, and offsets costs to libraries that circulate materials to patrons from other certified municipalities. State aid to public library funds may be used for any legitimate library purpose, whether that's updating technology, increasing <coughs> hours the library is open. Lawrence, for instance, recently added weekend hours back for the first time in decades. Paying network fees, expanding physical collections, anything that is for a, a legitimate library purpose. <coughs> libraries that are state aid certified also have access to reciprocal borrowing of over 59 million items from other libraries in the state. They have the ability to apply for construction grants and they have the ability to apply for federal LSTA grants and other programs. We have a great website, mblclegislativeagenda.com. Go take a look at it. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Copy it down. <laughs> uh, it features quotes from library directors and how they use their state aid and allows users to see how many items their local library receive from other communities and how much money their communities save by being certified in the state aid program. Librarians are also sharing how they use the state aid on social media and these posts are appearing on the web page 
and this is our priority for the year. In addition to state aid, commissioners are also requesting increases in support of other lines. Our Board of Library Commissioners Line 9101, the very top line, uh, funds the uh, office and small staff that administers the seven lines of funding in our operating budget. We thank the governor for supporting an increase to this line in his H2 budget proposal, which will help pay for the significant rent increase that the MBLC will experience in FY 2021 due to our required move to new office space. If you've been, ever been to our office, our lease has expired, <coughs> and you know that that area has just been, it's right near North Station, has just gone crazy, and there's no way we can afford to stay in that, in that building. State aid to regional libraries, Sarah's here, is going to talk about that in a moment, 9401. This line funds, primarily funds the Massachusetts library system and the library for the Commonwealth. We thank legislators for the significant increase to this line for the current fiscal year, which helped stabilize funding for the MLS and the LFC, and in particular strengthened our statewide delivery program, making it more sustainable for the future. More on that in a moment. Talking book libraries at Perkins and Worcester, line 9402 and 9406, we have a representative here. Um, the Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library in Watertown and the Worcester Talking Book Library provide accessible library services in Massachusetts to over 25,000 individuals with disabilities who are unable to read traditional print materials due to a visual or physical disability. Uh, these are both renowned, both of the organizations are renowned for their leadership in this area. Technology and resource sharing, we'll hear about that also in a moment, line 9506. Primarily funds our nine automated networks and a portion of the statewide databases and electronic resources that we provide in partnership with the MLS, including trusted resources like the New York Times, the Globe, <coughs> Encyclopedia, and other journal articles. The networks provide the Commonwealth residences with critical library infrastructure and connectivity. We thank the legislators for their significant increase to this line in the current fiscal year, which allowed the MBLC to offer a new grant program to the networks that support statewide sharing of ebooks and audiobooks as well as licensing of five new statewide research databases that are indispensable research tools for students of all ages. <coughs> and finally, of those seven lines, the Massachusetts Center for the Book, 9508, is the Commonwealth's affiliate of the Library of Congress Center for the Book, which promotes books and libraries, literacy and reading. The Center for the Book has struggled in recent years due to level funding since FY 2016. An increase in funding for the Center would help enable it to fulfill its promise to operate as a public-private partnership supporting lifelong literacy. Now, a, a word or two about the uh, Public Library Construction Program. This is a wonderful program. It's been in existence since 1987, and in that time, grants made possible by this program have helped to plan and, con and construct improved libraries in 227 municipalities throughout the Commonwealth. Nearby towns receiving grant funds have included Framingham, Ashland, Hopkinton, Northborough, Shrewsbury. Wonderful library, Shrewsbury. Oh my gosh, I was at the grand opening. <laughs> oh. <coughs> and Marlborough, which is currently under construction. And I have two requests in this regard. First, we ask for your support of the bond bill H4154, an act financing the general governmental in infrastructure of the Commonwealth. H4154 currently sits in the House Ways and Means Committee and contains $150 million for public library construction projects. If approved at this funding level, the MBLC will be able to fund the remaining 17 library projects that are currently queued in the construction program waiting list. <coughs> These are outstanding projects that have undergone rigorous review and years of planning and building local support. Nearby libraries on this wait list include Westboro, which is number four on the list with a $9.403 million grant, and Grafton, which is number nine on the list with a $7.435 million grant. As Maureen also said, there are some 45 communities who have already indicated interest in a next construction grant round. 28 of those communities are already, in fact, in the preliminary planning stages. Our second and equally critical need this year with regard to construction it's for your help with our request to the Governor's Office and the Executive Office of Administration and Finance, called ANF, to raise the annual cap on construction spending from 20 million annually to 25 million. It's a small increase as increases go on the state level, but it's very important for us in the library community. The program has been held to a $20 million annual spending cap for seven years, limiting the number of projects that can be underway at any given time and pushing out projects on the wait list several years. 
Construction costs have increased some 30% over the course of this current grant round, which means that raising the cap and accelerating the remaining waitlist projects, even a little bit, will save money. The construction grants stay the same. As construction costs rise, that money, the difference really has to be made up by the local community. Lester, for instance, as an example, <coughs> uh, from the time that Lester let out their construction bid documents uh, and got their grant to the time that they actually <coughs> broke ground and signed a contract with a contractor, uh, their project had gone up by a million dollars. And that difference had to be made up by the local community and by <coughs> individuals giving, giving money directly. So the faster we can move these projects through, the more it saves money. It's, it's pretty simple. We can, by increasing the cap by $5 million, we will shorten the wait list overall by three years or more. And we want to see these projects move along as, as expeditiously as possible. So we're asking every town that has ever received a construction grant, as Maureen said, to pay it forward, you know, to, to ask their legislators to actively support the bond bill and also call the governor's office and ANF to increase the cap. <coughs> There's a handout on the construction program. And uh, Andrea Bunker from the MBLC, where's Andrea? Over here, our construction specialist is here with me today to answer any any questions about that. So it's really, as, you know, just to emphasize what Maureen said, it's really important that we all speak up as much as we can about library funding. Many reps have said to me, you know, if I don't hear from you, I think everything is okay. And so they do need to hear from us, and they need to hear from us on a regular basis. <clears throat> it's not enough just to come and listen to speeches here or even to go to Legislative Day on Beacon Hill, which, by the way, is April 2nd. Hope to see you all there uh, on Beacon Hill. Please do not let this be the end of it. Uh, take extra copies of the legislative agendas and other materials back to your trustees and friends. So just to sum up, finally, here are the three takeaways. Let your legisl legislators know how important library funding is to you and your town. Ask them to, for their support. Number two, prioritize line 9501, state aid to public libraries in your communications. And number three, please ask legislators to support H4154 with the $150 million in library construction funding and ask them to indicate to ANF that they support increasing the annual spending cap of 20 to $25 million. That's as much as I have to say. I think that was quite a lot. I hope, <laughs> I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much. I mean, did you guys know you were going to have to make this many phone calls? <laughs> <laughs> this many, right? um, so I'm just on a first name basis with everybody moving forward. So we're going to have Sarah now from the Mass Library System come up and tell us about the great stuff MLS does. Thank you, Ryan. Um, good morning. My name is Sarah. Is this? Uh, my name is Sarah Sigigian. I'm the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Library System, or MLS as you'll hear me uh, refer to it today. I'm joined by Terry McCown, our new Consulting and Training Services Director. Hi, Terry. Thank you. Thank you for including MLS in your breakfast today. And thank you to all of you, the state and local officials, the library staff and trustees, friends, partner organizations, and especially members of the public who have come out this morning to support their local library. The Massachusetts library system is about equity. We make it possible for people across the state to access information and resources that many individual community libraries simply can't afford to offer on their own. We're a state-supported nonprofit funded by line 709401. Please pick up a handout, which I forgot to put out. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'll have them for you after. To learn more about the critical services our organization provides to our almost 1,600 member libraries. <clears throat> we know firsthand that library funding comes from lots of different places, from funding in community budgets to donations raised by library support groups. State aid to public libraries means local aid to libraries. MLS supports the, le the MBLC legislative agenda. We understand that every library in the state benefits from the sharing of resources which is why we are incredibly proud of our statewide delivery system. Our delivery service transports millions of items across the state each year. Between July 2018 and June 2019, over 13 million items were delivered, 3.5 million of which were in the CW Mars network. This service fosters equity of access of library resources to everyone in Massachusetts. Thank you to all who have advocated for MLS services 
and to the Massachusetts legislators who have voted to support these important services, especially statewide delivery. MLS has been spending appropriations responsibly over the past several years to continue providing all of our services, despite significantly rising costs in the delivery program <coughs> due to the minimum wage increase and other elements of the grand bargain. The increase to our budget line this year has enabled us to continue to fund this critical service. In addition to sustaining delivery, we've also been able to restore resources that were previously cut, notably databases on essential topics like science and career transitions, as well as adding the popular Heritage, Heritage Quest online genealogy collection. In order to contain, uh, no, excuse me, in order to continue to sustain these services for Southborough and for all of Massachusetts's communities, we'll, be, we'll need an increase of 3% this coming year and in the foreseeable future. And I want to, enclose, uh, to close by encouraging all of the patrons and community members here today to share your priorities with both local and state elected officials and to sign up for the email list to keep informed about library needs. I believe the link to that library list is on the legislative agenda link that Roland had shared. Um, please let your elected officials know how important the library is in your, in, in your lives and community. Thank you again for your time and advocacy. You may not know this, but Southborough is a C.W. Mars library. To hear more about what it means to be a C.W. Mars library, we have Jeanette, the executive director of C.W. Mars. Thank you, Ryan. So now you know that, <laughs> that Southborough is one, a member of C.W. Mars. Um, and most of you probably know uh, that CW Mars is one of nine automated library uh, network systems in Massachusetts. CW Mars is the largest library network in Massachusetts. So we have um, 149 member libraries located throughout central and western Massachusetts, um, including Southborough and Marlboro and Shrewsbury and Westboro, and I'm sure there's other library directors here as well. Um, our newest library, uh, public library, is in Hancock, Massachusetts, which is on the New York border. And they received uh, state uh, certification this year, um, which was the first time since 1975, um, which is fantastic. And they were able to join CW Mars. So uh, we are excited to be um, basically uh, helping them get their collections online for sharing. I'd like to just take a few minutes today to talk about the importance of line 9506. And this is the line that provides funding for the automated library networks. In your packet, the MBLC provided a handout with a summary of some of the lines. And line 9506, the automated library network line, is in the middle on the back side. Thank you, MBLC, for <laughs> the visual. Um, one of the most important things that this line does is allow us to offset our membership costs. It's really important for CW Mars that we keep costs affordable for our member libraries. CW Mars has 95 of our 149 libraries that are in communities of under 10,000 people. Um, and this line funding is what makes membership possible for some of our smaller libraries. Being a member of CW Mars means that the residents in Southboro are able to access collections and resources of all 149 libraries in our system which gives them access to over 8 million physical items and 90,000 electronic items. CW Mars also provides technology and tech support to our libraries. 9506 funding helps us offset equipment and hardware costs. Um, as you know, technology keeps changing and um, equipment also has a shelf life. We strive to provide, uh, update all of our servers um, every five years. We have 13 servers currently running our online shared catalog. Uh, we also provide hardware, routers, and switches for the 119 libraries that use a CW Mars internet connection. So line 9506 helps us offset some of our equipment and our infrastructure costs. Our libraries continue to provide vital services in their communities, and usage is strong across the network. In 2019, we had over 11 million checkouts of physical items, quite a number of these traveling through MLS's delivery system. Our e-content usage also continues to grow. In 2018, we reached our first 1 million checkouts on e-content. 
In 2019, we hit 1 million checkouts in nine months. 2019 saw a total of 1.3 million checkouts and 599,000 holds from over 78,000 active users for our e-collections. CW Mars was named one of the top 25 library consortia worldwide in digital circulation. The rise in ebooks, um, we've heard from our readers that they like that they can easily increase font sizes. Um, so readers with low vision or just needing bigger fonts as our eyes age um, are able to control how big those fonts are. And it also gives them another option from um, the large print hardcover books. Ebooks have long been popular with travelers. They are very portable, they are light. Um, we also hear from readers who have dis difficulty holding and manipulating the pages in a physical book that ebooks e are helpful in that. There's also been a rise in audiobooks. Um, we're seeing newer cars coming out without CD players. Our Overdrive Libby app is compatible with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Um, it's interesting because I'm standing in front of the <laughs> Audiobooks are not cheating sign, um, which is very <laughs> apropos as um, my son, who actually struggles with reading due to dyslexia, um, relies on audiobooks. And he, our family often will buy the print copy and then he will use his public library and CW Mars to uh, place holds on the audio format. In that way, he's able to listen and read at the same time. Um, the multiple formats really help with processing speed and help him to build confidence and be able to read at grade level. And we've heard from other readers um, that the audiobooks really do help bridge gaps between um, readers who have difficulty um, with print materials. Li our libraries believe that readers should have access to the formats that work best for them. The demand for e-content continues to grow. Our wait time for e-content is on average 40 days. That's over one month, and that can be forever to a 12-year-old. <laughs> so line 9506 funding allows us to purchase additional e-content to try and keep up with requests for new titles and also help keep wait times down on titles that have long hold queues. It helps us fund, us fund additional purchasing of ebooks and audiobooks for our shared collection that's available to all CW Mars patrons and also new this year available to other residents of other networks throughout Massachusetts. So thank you so much for hearing just a few things that Line 9506 funding does and uh, for your continued support. This legislative breakfast would not have been possible without the Central Massachusetts Library Advocates Group. This group is new, and the chair of the breakfast committee is actually here uh, this morning. So it's Lisa Kieber, who is waving very sheepishly in the back. But she did a great job organizing all these breakfasts across um, the central uh, region, and I complicated this by moving my date, because we were originally <laughs> supposed to be in Valentine's Day, so thank you, Lisa, for all your help. But Lisa's not the one you'll be hearing from this morning. <laughs> it's going to be another amazing speaker, Bernadette from Bellingham. So I'm Bernadette Rivera, the director of the Bellingham Library, and Roland and Maureen have inspired me to deviate from my speech for a minute. Um, I guess from what Roland said, my library must have been one of the first libraries to receive a construction grant because it opened in 1989 and the yeah. project was 1987. So I think we were one of the first ones. And I wasn't, didn't even live in town then. I, didn't, I don't think I knew Bellingham existed then, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but what I see is that having that building in 1987 made it that over the years, our state aid money has been used to keep that building current and updated. So. Um, yeah, not that the town hasn't funded things like carpeting, but a lot of things, furniture, things that we couldn't have done have been done with the state aid program. So not only is the construction part important, the state aid has given us the ability to keep our facility modern and updated. So that's my little deviation. Um, I'm here today representing CMLA. I'm the treasurer of the organization. Um, we're a group of librarians who, in 2018, began discussions on how to best represent Central Massachusetts libraries, both as library advocates and as a continuing education source for our librarians, library staff, and library supporters. In late 2018, we attained the 51 c 3 status from the IRS, so we're a nonprofit, and we're actively seeking new members to support our organization. This year, we have taken over, as Ryan um, 
referred to coordinating these breakfasts. We're hosting five of them over the next few weeks. Last year, late last year, we were awarded a $7,000 grant from the Community Foundation of North Central Massachusetts. These grant funds are being used to set up our organizational infrastructure, as well as to begin offering programming to the Central Massachusetts librarians. In addition to roundtables for library directors and other staff, we have a couple of upcoming events that I'd like to tell you about. On Wednesday, March 25th at 10 a.m. at the Air Public Library, there'll be a training active bystanders workshop. Presented by Quabbin Meditation, this program empowers bystanders and gives them competencies to analyze situations where harm may be occurring, evaluate the consequences for everyone involved, and interrupt harm doing and generate positive actions by others. On Tuesday, June 2nd, we'll be hosting a services fair for librarians at the Woods Memorial Library in Barry. Social and community service agencies from the area will inform librarians about resources that are available to help people in their communities. And last but not least, very fun, on Friday, May 1st, at the VFW in Sutton, we'll be hosting our second annual librarian trivia contest, not just for librarians, bring your, your friends, your trustees, your people together. And um, we had a great turnout last year in Barrie. Um, really like 70 people showed up to play trivia. It was super fun. Um, so get your groups together and come play trivia with us and support CMLA. Um, we invite you to attend one of our meetings and see how you can become involved in better library advocacy for your library and your staff. Check out our website, cmlagroup.org, for details on these programs. On your chair is a form to join and our brochure um, that tells you what we're doing. Um, pick up a brochure. We have a variety of membership categories for individuals, families, friends, groups, trustees, all kinds of, um, so one of them will work for you, so please join CMLA. Thank you. We also have membership packets up at the front in case you guys didn't get one on your chair. Um, I'm saying this because I'm also um, helping out with membership. So <laughs> it's not just for librarians, it's for trustees, and it's for anybody who loves libraries. So library staff, anybody. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, which is very exciting because we have a couple surprise guest speakers, everyone, and I know you want to hear from them. So first up is Margaret Cardello, one of my favorite library directors, <laughs> who's going to talk a little bit about what's been happening at the Marlboro Public Library. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so uh, exciting things are happening in Marlboro, and I'm pleased to give you an update. We are the fortunate recipients of a construction grant. Um, and this is People just always ask me, so are you excited? And I say, I have to think of new words be, be, besides awesome, excited. We're thrilled um, to be doing the work that we're doing in Marlboro right now regarding the library. Um, so we did receive a construction grant. Um, our city has purchased three uh, neighboring homes to expand both our site for the facility and for parking. Um, we held four public sessions to um, debut our design to our public, and we got lots and lots and lots and lots of <laughs> feedback. Um, so we're, we're in the process right now of looking at our design and see how well it meets the needs of our uh, residents in Marlboro and to see how we can tweak things to make it work um, for today and for well into the future. <coughs> Um, we are, uh, as I say, fortunate recipients of a grant, and I don't know really how other state agencies work, but I know the MBLC, mm -hmm. and um, very well. For I've been in libraries in Massachusetts for over 25 years, and I'm pleased that we have a real partnership with the MBLC. Andrea Buffer is our consultant, and um, she's always at the end of the phone when I need, hey Andrea, what do you think of this? Um, so we are just so thrilled and um, our building will move from 22,000 square feet to 38,000 square feet. We'll have expanded parking. We'll have um, all the things that Marlboro residents said they wanted, community space. Um, we'll have an, a much expanded children's department, a uh, preschool area, Marlboro history room, training room, um, and 
by my last count, nine meeting spaces for the public of various sizes from the smallest for tutoring to the largest, which is a 200 seat community meeting space uh, right downtown in Marlboro. So I've never worked on a more exciting or rewarding or um, thrilling project and stay tuned. Uh, great things are coming to Marlboro. So thank you. I don't want to say I'm jealous. <laughs> so remember at the beginning when I told you that we were going to have somebody talk from the Friends of the Saltburg Library. I was just making sure you guys were paying attention because we have the president, <laughs> Beth Mello, who's going to say a few quick words about our friends. Thank you. Um, so. I have been the president of the Friends of the Southboro Library for, I don't know, far too many years now. <laughs> Anyone wants to volunteer to <laughs> step up? But um, over the past few years, we've, our dedicated core of volunteers has expanded a bit, and it's great. Um, we're able to support programs for all uh, different ages at the library. We consider ourselves, and this is a line that predates me, the icing on the cake for the library, um, helping to fund things that the library can't normally fund through its budget. But it wouldn't be s possible without all the other support that the library gets. Um, without that support, our program funds would have to go insufficiently towards um, the resources the community um, so is able to take advantage of through the library. And one of the things I love about the library is the fact that it's really a community center. And the programs we sponsor, they wouldn't be possible if we didn't have a community center like this. Um, we couldn't possibly rent the space somewhere else or you know find um, the accommodations to hold these <coughs> programs that encourage literacy and um, expanding the horizons of youth looking at different things. Um, we wouldn't be able to host the uh, programs that bring together uh, voters um, who want to learn about, um, for instance, we have an upcoming annual town meeting and the library is, norm is, is one of the key places where people use it to hold presentations to let people know um, about the issues. Um, there are programs for adults, continuing education type of thing, just, um, it's probably not the right words, but except that we consider that the library is part of um, continuing education in terms of um, just that the community adults are always striving hopefully to learn more about different areas of interest um, so I, I also want to take a step back in terms of my role um, why I came into the Friends of the Library and that's because um, I have a relationship with the library that dates back to when I was um, a young teen and I began working here um, after the head librarian noticed that I was taking out so many books she brought up the opportunity to work here part-time and it, it was wonderful <coughs> and it opened my eyes to how much a center of this small town the library was I would see people coming in who um, otherwise might feel disconnected and lonely who were coming and talking to our small town librarians and um, having a chat and letting off some of um, the steam of what was going on, the pressures in their lives. Um, and then as a mother of young children, uh, I came to a new appreciation of the library when I found that there is no way I could have afforded to um, support the voracious reading habits of my children. Um, and the Thank you so much, C.W. Mars, <laughs> because even this library um, couldn't support uh, some of my daughter's <laughs> reading habits, and it's so wonderful. I remember the days when you'd have a, an occasional request for some book the library didn't have, and you'd have to the librarians would have to go through this big yeah. catalog and write out this form. It was complicated, and you only had a few requests like that a, a month. And now people every day go online and just easily request the materials they will want in it 
so quickly shows up so that it's not just these walls that are housing the collection for the community. And um, for, uh, as a mother of a young teen daughter, I see how all of the resources she has, we, we live in a sort of sheltered community, um, but her ability to read books that expand her worldview, both uh, fiction and nonfiction, that um, provide an insight into life beyond this town. Um, I, I really appreciate it. So um, thank you all for coming out today to our little town library. The friends have also um, helped to support the library's brand new team room, which is downstairs. And I actually have the 3D printer going right now, <laughs> so following the breakfast. <laughs> if anybody wants a little tour, um, come and see me, and I'm happy to take anybody down there. We also have free mouse pads that were provided by the friend from the Love Your Library campaign, and magnets with their hours, because I know you guys all want to come back. <laughs> but we're not done yet. <laughs> we have, if you check your program, you can see we have a guest of honor and it is Representative Carolyn Dykema. <laughs> she was just here on Thursday night taking pictures with everybody who won Cultural Arts Council grants, but she's back and she is going to amaze you, okay? <laughs> no pressure. I hate to be to be tethered to the uh, to the podium there, but I just wanted um, to say thank you for the invitation to be here today. I think that the stakes are high now with that with that introduction. I'm not <laughs> sure uh, honestly how much I'm going to be able to add to the wonderful stories that were already shared today about the passion people have for the library and the important role that it plays in their lives. Uh, the one thing uh, of all the things, the wonderful things I heard, there is one thing though that I want to take issue with. And that is something that Roland said about the material about the budget being dry. So the budget is for a legislator. There is nothing more exciting and engaging than budget conversation. So I beg to differ. Um, I also want to say thank you to Ryan. So Ryan, um, thank you for pulling together this wonderful meeting. And I want to give a personal shout out to Ryan who saved me from a book club emergency. <laughs> so we had a, a recommendation for a great book that, as it turned out, was out of print, completely out of print, and I couldn't find it anywhere. And I had mentioned it to Ryan. I said, is there any chance the South Pearl Library has this book? And he said, I don't know. I'll check. So Ryan actually ordered the book, um, got it to me, and it is now um, part of the library connection, collection. So I think that really just speaks to the spirit of um, Ryan, of course, but, of, but I think of, of librarians um, everywhere in this Commonwealth, and I think it just is such a testament to your responsiveness and what you give back to the community. Um, so, like I said, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to hope to add maybe a few different perspectives on libraries from a legislative um, point of view. Um, first, with respect to the budget and advocacy, and I want to shout out, so Maureen Ambrosino, Maureen Amiot, who is here, uh, wonderful. So Ryan and Maureen are in my district. I'm very fortunate to have them. I uh, had mentioned, I think it was Minions, was it, was it Minions, or what was the word? Munchkins. Was? Munchkins. <laughs> so I guess I want to uh, dispel any suggestion that, um, that libraries would think that they have uh, a lack of, of significant influence on what happens in the state legislature and at the state house. Uh, I think your um, influence and the importance of what you do is very well known in the state legislature. I think one of the things that you have that, frankly, a lot of other advocacy don't, groups don't have is you have a presence in every single city and town mm -hmm. in this commonwealth and that is not something that could be understated and no long, not, not only do you have a presence you have a, an active constituency and frankly a growing active constituency who use your library services and who rely on your services who we also hear from so I think that your um, your influence is is substantial with respect to other groups that we hear from. And I think one testament to that is the fact that you actually have a library caucus. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, it, it, the caucus has not, caucuses are kind of a thing that we do at the State House as a way to kind of mobilize and organize around a specific interest that's important to those of us who participate. Uh, and it was back in the, um, during the recession actually, when there was a lot of conversations about 
everything in the budget and you know we were, were going to have to make some really hard cuts and at that time as many of you probably all of you remember there was this sort i remember there was this like undercurrent of like well we have technology like do we really need library like what do libraries do how are we gonna you know kind of get our arms around this and there was a tremendous effort led by my classmate actually and who came into the legislature with me kate hogan um, to pull together, who worked closely with the libraries, has a, a co very compelling personal story about her attachment to libraries and her mother, um, who pulled together all of us and really built up this caucus to the point now where it is a uh, it is a force, honestly, that Ways and Means and the other folks, all of us who make decisions about um, money, pay careful attention to. So I would encourage you, if you don't um, know your uh, library caucus uh, connection or, or whether your legislator is a member of the library caucus, I would doubt that they are not. Um, but just know that all of the information that we receive at these breakfasts and as well as your calls is reinforced enforced then out of the library caucus who also sends us updates on kind of what the priorities are. So um, you have a lot of advocacy and there's a lot more we can do together. So I wanna just note um, this, these are just sort of my personal perspectives on libraries now. And I think that libraries are the gold standard for a public institution and its ability, its resiliency, and its ability to adapt to a changing world. Uh, I think you, you do it better than anyone. Um, when I look at um, what you do, what certainly what happens in my own district, but I know happens um, all over with integrating technology. You know, the, the systems that you use to share books, to provide access to folks who need, um, you know, computers that maybe they don't have at home. Pe people who are looking for jobs. You know, all of these things that are needs in our communities. I have, I see no other <coughs> public organization, and frankly private organization, that is as responsive, as effectively as our public libraries. Things like culture and the arts. You know, I've seen a resurgence in this, this attention to culture and the arts. Uh, I think probably because of, you know, kind of the crazy world we live in, I think people sometimes, you know, enjoy um, those things as a, as a counterweight. Mm -hmm. You know, I was here, Brian, uh, Brian mentioned, I was here on Thursday with the Cultural Arts Council here in South Bro um, as a way to um, celebrate the arts and, and come together and endorse these things that we support as communities. Um, I also, um, you know, want to maybe highlight something that sort of a way I think of libraries that maybe others don't. Uh, I, th I see libraries as a um, really a public health um, type of institution. And, and it may surprise you to hear me say that, and I just want to explain. Many of you, you know, community is really important. It's really important to our health, to our mental health to be connected to the community, to being able to feel like we have a role in something bigger. Uh, if you, the Surgeon General has actually um, highlighted that uh, social isolation is at the heart of many of the challenges that we face today and that we deal with in the legislature. Things from substance abuse to um, suicide to, to all of these, these challenges that we're struggling with and I see our libraries as a convening place for our communities as kind of how do we get to the heart of that? You know, how do we create events like this, events like the um, Culture and Arts Council gathering, things like teen rooms as a way to connect to each other in the community. Some one of the speakers said that, that the library is kind of our community center, right? Um, I really believe that's true and I think that when you look at what libraries are doing, they're doing more and more of that. Um, the other aspect of this is lifelong learning. Right? So lifelong learners are shown to have longer lifespans, be happier, um, have happier family lives, um, and that's what you do here. You promote lifelong learning, um, and you do it in a way that is accessible, that is um, meaningful, and that is um, done honestly in the most financially uh, efficient and sustainable way of, of many, many organizations that I've seen. So you just, you do so much, um, multi-dimensional, and I wanna highlight back to the advocacy point, this, this, <laughs> as would be appropriate for libraries, is the most effective mm -hmm. 
advocacy document when it comes to advocating for state funding that I have seen. And I remember there were a number of us when we were talking about uh, budgets a number of years ago, we were like, the library, the way they do this and they lay it out and what happened last year and you know where the gaps are. So I guess leave it to the library to uh, do their research and put together a really compelling, um, I would say action-packed, uh, concise packet of information for us here as legislators. So um, being sensitive to everyone's time, I just want to, again, thank you for all you do, for members of the public who are, who are here to support um, public libraries. Thank you to our local um, Sam Stivers, local Board of Selectmen. We've got Mark Purple and uh, Vanessa Hale from um, Southboro, you know, Southboro um, uh, administrative offices who are here also in support of, of Ryan's great work. Um, and the importance of the library. I'm just glad to be a part of it. And please know that you've got some very active, um, engaged advocates on your behalf uh, working um, at the state level on both construction funding as well as the funding um, that you request every year so you can continue your good work. So thank you. I don't think I undersold her. No. Right. <laughs> Um, so we have some um, information from some of the groups you heard about up front. Remember, free gifts, <laughs> can't beat that. And then there's coffee and breakfast still in the back. Um, you're welcome to stay, uh, but I know many of you have to go. So uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it, and I hope you had a wonderful morning. Thank you.